Language is such a fascinating concept in psychology, and uh, one of the reasons that it appears in this chapter is basically because there is this um, bi-directional relationship between language and cognition. In other words, uh, as we get more advanced in our ability to think, that allows us to communicate in more advanced ways. And, you know, thinking and communicating, they go hand in hand. So what we're going to focus on in this video is language and language development. And uh, the textbook has some more information, but we're going to cover some of the more general aspects right here for you. So I really like this quote because... Um, I don't know, the first time I heard it, it really stuck with me. So let's read it. Language is so fundamental to our experience, so deeply a part of being human, that it's hard to imagine life without it. Now, we use language for everything. I, mean, I can't even think about something that I do that doesn't involve language, at least um, in some way. I'm sure we could debate that topic, but you know, that really, um, we communicate to each other in, in really complex ways, way more complex than any other animal. One of the questions we'll ask is, uh, do other animals speak a language? And really it depends on how you, uh, how you try and answer that question or how you try to define language. But there's no debate about it. We are in a category of our own when it comes to language and communication. So let's first break apart language into uh, the structure. At the most basic level, you have phonemes. Phonemes are the most basic unit of sound. So for example, the word cradle has a number of phonemes, like right in the beginning of the word cradle is the sound k. Importantly, phonemes do not necessarily have meaning when they are by themselves. So they are the most basic unit of sound, but oftentimes you bring phonemes together to bring about meaning, and that's where we get morphemes. Morphemes are the smallest unit of meaning in a language. So when you actually have the ability to spread meaning from one person to another, we're talking about morphemes. And then finally, grammar. Grammar refers to the rules of a language that allow us to communicate effectively. And, you know, I'm not a linguist, but we're talking about things like where a noun goes relative to a verb and an adjective so that I can communicate to you um, in a way that can be understood. If I didn't use grammar, if I just took the same words and mixed them up however I wanted, it would be a lot more difficult, I assume, for you to understand me. So grammar is just the rules that allow effective communication. Next, think about the development of language. Clearly, we don't speak a language when we are first born. Or do we? I mean, it depends, again, how we define language. Because babies can certainly cry, and that is a way of communicating their basic needs. But if we're talking about communicating in terms of the use of things like complex grammar, we don't do that at birth. So the development of language is something that happens over time. Before we can actually produce language, we are in what's called the receptive language phase. And this basically is the idea that we can sometimes, as a, as a newborn or as an infant, in the first few months of life, we can understand when people are talking to us. So for example, you know, by six weeks of age, babies, they understand that um, you know, people are making eye contact with them. So they can receive language, babies, before they can produce language. But what we're gonna focus on mostly is the productive side of language. And this is just average uh, development. You know, there's always um, um, children who develop faster and slower. But on average, we see the development of the productive language phase as follows. So by four months of age, babies start babbling. Babbling is where uh, you go beyond just making noise. So, you know, uh, young children in, in like the first and second months of life, they will start to coo. Cooing is like ahs and oohs. You know, a baby might be like, ah. That's just cooing. Babbling, which 
on, you know, on average starts around four months of age is where you start to introduce consonants. So instead of ahs and oohs, you might get ba, boo, you know, actually um, stringing together a variety of sounds. Here's something I find really fascinating. Up until about 10 months of age, infants all over the world, they pretty much sound the same. Their babbling is, you know, pretty much universal. It sounds the same no matter where you are. But by 10 months of age, the babbling of an infant starts to reflect the sounds of their household language. In other words, a child growing up in a uh, Spanish-speaking household is going to start speaking or babbling slightly differently than a child growing up in a Chinese-speaking household, for example. So what that tells us is that nurture or the environment probably is doing something here. It's molding children. You know, and it takes about 10 months of listening to start producing sounds that reflect the culture you grow up in. Okay, by about uh, age one or 12 months of age, children might start to enter the one word stage. And we're gonna come back to that because that's an interesting idea. How do we go from just babbling to actually producing words that we think are meaningful or that are meaningful, like mama, dada? All right. So we'll come back to that in just one moment. By two years of age, 24 months, children start to speak in sentences, but they're very basic rudimentary sentences, two words at most. So a child might say, uh, want juice or go car. These are basic sentences, and typically uh, a child needs a vocabulary of about 200 words before they're going to get into this two-word telegraphic speech stage. It's sometimes nicknamed the telegraphic speech stage because um, back in the days of a telegraph, to send messages, you know, thousands of miles, is not very easy, and so you wanted to shorthand everything. You know, it's like dee 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 dee. You didn't want these complex sentences. You had to shorthand everything, and therefore the way children speak, you know, like want juice, is really just a shortened version of more of a complex idea. Like I would like some juice, please. So it's basically their limited vocabulary prevents children from speaking in complex sentences. But think about this idea. The average vocabulary size of a six-year-old is about 10,000 words. So by age two, we have a vocabulary size of about 200 words. By age six, it's 10,000 words. We see rapid language development between ages two and six. We know that the environment plays a big role here. For example, uh, children who have parents that read to them typically show stronger vocabulary development in these early years. So nurture plays a big role. And that's actually what I wanted to use that as a, use that as a segue to go back to the one word stage. How or why does language develop in the way that it does? Is it nature or is it nurture? In other words, is it biology? that facilitates this language development, or is it the environment? Well, typically, it's both, and that is no exception here. Uh, in this example, let's first focus on nurture, or the environment. Think about babbling around 10 months of age, ba-ba-ba, ta-ta-ta, going into the one-word stage, you know, saying mama, for example. How does that transition occur? Well, from a, from a learning standpoint, thinking back to the learning chapter, think about two primary examples of learning. The first is observational learning or imitation. Babies will imitate the sounds that they hear in their environment. So that's something that we know occurs with babies, is that they hear their mom and dad saying certain things like, Mom, she might be encouraging the child to say mama by simply saying mama, mama, mama over and over. And the baby, they have those mirror neurons, those neurons that fire when they observe other behavior. And so they might imitate that behavior out of you know, nothing more than a reflex. And so we might get imitation. But the second important factor here is 
Operant conditioning. Remember from the learning chapter, operant conditioning is the idea that reinforcements and punishments change the likelihood of a behavior being repeated. So in this case, we're talking primarily about reinforcements or rewards. Now imagine a baby is saying, uh, you know, ta ta ta, ba ba ba, and they don't really get a um, a reaction from their parents. But then, just maybe by accident, they stumble upon the you know the babbling sounds of mama. When mom hears that noise, when mom hears the baby say mama, she's going to react. She's going to praise the child. She's going to say, yay, you said mama. From the, from the uh, baby's perspective, what they're thinking is, whoa, you know, when I said ba-ba, I didn't get a reaction. But when I said mama, I did get a reaction. Not only did I get a reaction, but I got one from the person who I love. You know, this is the person who's around me all the time. That must be an important sound that I made. So I don't really know if that's exactly what babies are thinking, but what we're getting at here is that rewards or operant conditioning reinforcement is one of the ways that we go from babbling into the one word stage. We learn that some sounds are meaningful and other sounds are not meaningful. And so we start to repeat those meaningful ideas. All right, we know that nurture matters, the environment matters. What about nature? The brain certainly plays a role. And uh, before we talk about uh, Broca's area and Wernicke's area, let's just think about the idea that from an evolutionary standpoint, we evolved to speak a language. And uh, there's one researcher um, who um, is probably most well known for his development of this idea. It's uh, Noam Chomsky. Chomsky is a linguist who argued that um, we have something called a language acquisition device. He called it the language acquisition device. Somewhere in the brain is this structure that allows us to speak a language. He was a linguist. He is a linguist. So he's not really referring to any specific area of the brain. He's just hypothesizing that the human brain is different from other animals. Because of his, um, his argument that goes something like this. So imagine, uh, here's the earth, and on this side of the earth you have one culture, and on this side of the earth you have a different culture. And over thousands of years, they, they each develop their own separate language that sounds very different from one another, it looks very different from one another, and they never had contact with the, with the other culture. So they were completely independent cultures. What is important about all of the thousands of languages that have been developed over time is that they all share something in common. And Chomsky calls it universal grammar. Even though languages sound very different from one another, they all abide by the same basic rules of grammar. And so, so Chomsky's argument is that if these two cultures were completely independent of one another, yet they still developed languages that have similarities, universal grammar, that means that the brains of humans as an animal species must be special in the ability to speak a language. So not only does nurture matter, as we just talked about on the previous slide, but nature matters as well. Of course it does. The, the brain is incredibly important for our language uh, ability. This is another example of parallel processing though. There is no one area of the brain that is responsible for language processing. Although the left side of our brain tends to be more important, especially if you are a right-handed individual. And I can't really go into detail on that, but uh, maybe you can do your own research on the relationship between handedness, whether you're righty or lefty, and language development. But we know that you know, language is processed all over the brain. And what, um, you know, research, what researchers have shown is that if you experience damage to a specific area of the brain, you might not lose all of your ability to speak a language, but it might affect a certain aspect of language. So think about me speaking language right now. Some part of my brain is processing um, body language. You know, I'm moving my arms a lot. Another part of my brain is registering my breathing. 
um, and how fast I'm speaking. And I feel like I'm speaking very fast right now and I apologize for that. Uh, another part of my brain is registering what words I want to use. Because, you know, I could use the word use or I could use the word utilize. So I'm making a choice and some part of my brain is doing that. I'm also taking in visual information. When I have a conversation with somebody in person, I'm monitoring their body language and I might be adjusting my communication accordingly. So sorry for the belabored point. What I'm getting at is many areas of my brain are operating simultaneously or in parallel with one another to bring about language. So if one area of my brain gets damaged, I might not necessarily stop being able to use language, but one aspect of language could be affected. So two famous examples of that are Broca's area and Wernicke's area. The word aphasia means an impairment. So if I have damage to one of these areas of the brain, it might impair some aspect of language. So first let's focus on Broca's area, which is part of the left frontal lobe uh, labeled there for you. Broca's area, if you get like, let's say a stroke or some damage to the brain in that area, people with Broca's aphasia can still speak a language. It's just that they have an incredibly difficult time doing so. So for example, there are some people who have Broca's aphasia that have an incredibly strong stutter when they speak a language. However, they can sing perfectly. So they could take a sentence and trying to read it could be incredibly difficult. But if they were trying to sing that exact same sentence, they'd have no trouble at all. So what that tells us is that this area of Broca's, this Broca's area, it must be important for translating our thoughts into spoken language. And there must be a different part of the brain that translates our thoughts into uh, musical language or singing. Okay, um, interestingly, I believe um, a student once told me there was a contestant on American Idol, the singing reality show, where um, this guy, he got really, really far in the competition and he had broke his aphasia or something similar because he, was, he couldn't speak very well at all. He had a really bad stutter, but he was an amazing singer. So language is processed all over the brain. Wernicke's area, uh, just real fast, people who have damage to that area of the brain, they can still speak, but what they want to say doesn't come out right. They are characterized by some, um, something psychologists call word salad. It's kind of like what comes out as gibberish. So if I wanted to say, you know, hello, how are you? Instead, what might come out is, you know, uh, pencil, dog, paper. So this tells us that because they can still speak, but the, but the, the, the appropriateness of their speech or the, the accuracy of their communication is not correct, Wernicke's area must have something to do with processing our thoughts into actual words. So language is processed all over the brain. All right. Last but not least, think about the idea that um, we share um, a large amount of our genes with other animals, primarily uh, primates. So one question is, can other animals speak a language? You know, maybe you have a dog and when the doorbell rings, your dog barks. That's a, that's a way of communicating to you. It's, hey, everybody, there's someone at the door. Everyone, let's, let's go get the door. Uh, animals have you know, complex communication in certain ways. So monkeys, for example, there are some s species of monkey that will uh, communicate to one another to warn each other of danger. But not only that, um, there's a species called the vervet monkey these monkeys will, will have different signals whether or not there's a danger coming from above, like an eagle, or a danger coming from the ground, like a leopard. So they have different words, if you will, to signal different ideas. But are we, you know, are we in a class of our own? Because let's think about um, some cases of trying to teach primates sign language. Uh, Nim Chimsky is, is 
kind of a, a play off of the, the name Noam Chomsky. But one of the more famous examples is Coco the Gorilla. And I'll post a video of Coco the Gorilla using sign language. Researchers have argued that Coco has learned hundreds of signs and that somebody who is fluent in ASL, American Sign Language, could have a rudimentary conversation with Coco. But there are some major criticisms of this research. The first is that maybe Coco doesn't really understand what she is doing. Maybe she's just doing these, re these repetitive behaviors, you know, sign language, just to get a reward, like food. Uh, in addition, even with years and years of training, we can only get these animals to the level of like a human two-year-old. So we cannot get any animal to use complex grammar or things like that. There are some scientists who might argue that we do see the use of novel communication um, in these gorillas and, and primates, but there's a big debate about whether or not what we're seeing is valid research or not. I think what's important to, 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 you know, to understand or to discuss about animals and language is that many animals communicate, but humans are the only animals that use complex grammar. And we are clearly uh, superior when it comes to language processing and uh, communication in this way. All right, so there you have it. Language is fundamental to everything we do. It is based off of simple ideas, phonemes, basic sounds, strung together to bring about complex ideas. And we develop language uh, with age and experience and thanks to a brain that is capable of processing language. So continue on to see how language not only affects the way we think, but our intelligence as well.